I'm going to read uh, two scriptures today. And the first one is kind of odd because I'm going to be talking about Joseph, uh, the man whose dreams came true. But Jeremiah uh, chapter 29, verse 11. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. And then uh, Genesis chapter 37, beginning with verse 2. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending his flocks. And his brothers, the sons of Bilah and the sons of Ziplah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born uh, in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word about him. God has a plan for all the universe. And that will of God, that plan is going to be fulfilled. Nothing can interdict, can stop the plan of God from being fulfilled. God also has a plan for each one of us individually. And with that plan, you can accept it, you can reject it, or you can try to fulfill some of it. But the plan of God is given to us in life, and that's the most significant thing that you're going to do in life. Doing and knowing the will of God. About well, about four and a half years ago, when I was first called to this church, I left immediately for seven weeks to go to Europe. My wife and I went to Barcelona, and uh, there we got to see a great cathedral, the Sangrada Familia, the Holy Family. And whatever you think of the architecture, it is an amazing structure. It has 18 huge spires. And it was designed by a man by the name of Antoni Gaudi. And you may think parts of it are a little gaudy, but it certainly is an amazing structure. And you know, after he designed the plant, they began building. And over the years, by the way, it's still not completed. Uh, after 130 years, they're still working on it. And they hope to maybe finish it sometime in the next decade or so. But thousands of people have worked on that from the beginning. Today, I think there are some 230 that are still working on it. But most of those workers, especially the beginning, probably had very little idea of how it was going to turn out. All they knew was they were working on their small part. You know, in the same way, God has a plan for building his kingdom. And every one of us has a small part to play. And we don't know what God's ultimately going to do. We don't know what the kingdom ultimately is going to look like. We just know that God has given us a part. And so it is with Joseph. And I want to look at this man. And uh, we have up there the man whose dreams came true. And there's the coat of many colors. Some will say they really don't know what the translation of the many colored coat was. It could be simply uh, an ornate coat, and that's how it's translated here. Some have said that it was a coat of long sleeves, but it was certainly a very beautiful and ornate coat, regardless of what it looked like, and this is the coat that Joseph was given. So first of all, let's look at his hopeful dreams. Now Joseph was the favored of his father Jacob. Jacob had some wives, and the first wife was Leah. Now, he didn't really want Leah, but he was trying to get her, get Rachel as his wife, and his father-in-law tricked him. He said, well, you've worked for me for seven years, but I can't give you Rachel, because Leah's not yet married. You have to marry her first. And so, reluctantly, Joseph agreed to that. And he worked seven more years, and finally he got Rachel, and Rachel was always the wife that he loved, the favored wife. He had many children by Leah, but he had only two by Rachel. 
The oldest of all was Joseph. And he loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. And one day he gave him that fancy coat. The Bible says that uh, they were infuriated by that. And they refused to talk to him or say something good about him as a result of it. And then he had uh, some dreams. One of those dreams, his brothers all had uh, sheaths of grain. And he had a sheath of grain. And the grains of the brothers bowed down before him. And he was unwise enough to tell his brothers what it meant. And they're saying, so one day we're going to bow down before you? Is that what you think? And then he told them another dream. The other dream was, uh, there was the sun that probably represented Jacob, and the moon probably representing his mother Rachel, and then the eleven stars were bowing down before him. And so they were determined to do something bad to him. Now he was probably not wise to tell them that, but I believe that all of that was a part of the plan of God. You see, God had to reveal that to the brothers so that uh, Joseph's life would unfold the way that God had planned it from the very beginning. Probably wasn't wise for Jacob to indicate that this was his favorite son. Uh, it's not good for a parent to show favorites among their children. And so, the brothers were infuriated by him. Now, what, is, what does it mean by these dreams? Well, the, the gift was not the dreaming. Everybody has dreams. The gift was interpreting the dreams. You know, if you look in uh, history, dreams have been very important. You know that Albert Einstein had the theory of relativity? It came from something in a dream. And you know, we learn about uh, E equals MC squared when we're in school, but we don't really understand exactly what it means. Maybe Johan does. The rest of us have no idea. Uh, but he gave, that came to him in a dream. When uh, Paul McCartney wrote uh, the song yesterday, the tune came to him in a dream. A lot of artists and a lot of scientists have somehow been able to work out complex problems in their dreams. But what do the dreams mean? Well, I looked on the internet and I did a search from Google and boy, there were, there were countless people saying that they could interpret dreams. But I also read about the scientists, the psychologists, and they say there's no scientific basis for understanding what the dreams mean. Now, if you look at those that say that they can interpret, there are a couple things that seem to stand out all the time. One of those is they say that if you're running away from something in a dream, that probably indicates that you're afraid of some person or situation and trying to get out of it. Uh, some time ago, my wife and I were asleep, and in the middle of the night, I kicked her. And she said, Wayne, what are you doing? I said, what, what, what? She said, you kicked me really hard. And she, I said, well, I was dreaming, and I was dreaming that there was a robot that was chasing me. And he grabbed a hold of my legs in a culvert, and I kicked him to get him off my legs. And she still brings that up to me after a long time. She, I don't think she's completely forgiven me for kicking her. And then another common interpretation is that you, if you find yourself like in your underwear and you're in the middle of a crowd, that's an indication that probably you're insecure about something. And I admit, I, I had that kind of dream when I was uh, a kid and a young teenager. Maybe I was insecure about some things, but I don't know what the meaning is. But the, the gift that Joseph had was God gave him the ability to understand the dreams. Now what does that mean for us? Are we to interpret dreams? No, I don't think so. God gives every one of us a gift to fulfill his plan. He gave it to Joseph the ability to interpret dreams. And in the New Testament, there are at least three lists the gift, the spiritual gifts that believers have. And so you might have the gift of encouragement and you fulfill God's plan 
by encouraging others. You might have the gift of service. In fact, Jesus said uh, that's the greatest of the gifts, being a servant to all. And there are always people in the church uh, like Phyllis that's been making the cookies every week. Decided she didn't want to do that anymore, but she's been doing it <clears throat> as a gift of service. And we offer that to God. Just kidding, Kim. <laughs> or you might have the gift of giving. God has allowed you to make money. And the, Paul said the reason that we have money is so that we can share that with other people. And so you have that gift. You have the gift of teaching. You may have the gift of preaching or some other gift. And you fulfill God's plan by exercising that gift in building His kingdom. And you, like Joseph, may not understand all of it when it happens. But you know that this is a gift from God. And you're responsible for the way that you use it. But then secondly, not only are there hopeful dreams, but they're also shattered dreams. <clears throat> now several bad things happened to Joseph in his life. His brothers became angry at him. They hated him. They wanted to kill him. And so one day Jacob sent Joseph to check on the flocks that the brothers were watching. And they saw him coming and they had a plot. They were going to get rid of him. So he got there and Reuben, who was the eldest, and uh, you know, he said, well, let's, let's not kill him. Let's throw him in the pit. And then they were talking about what they were going to do. And he said, well, he is a blood relative and we don't want his blood on our hands. Uh, let's sell him instead. And so they got him from the pit and there were some travelers going through on the way to Egypt and they sold their brother into slavery. And so here's a young man that had been privileged. He had seen him almost everything and now he was in the slave market. And he was sold to a man by the name of Potiphar. You know, but even in that, God was in it. God blessed the work that he was doing for Potiphar, Potiphar who was uh, the king's chief god. And uh, everything began to go well. In fact, so well that Potiphar made him the manager of all of his properties and all of his estates. And so Joseph seemed to be doing pretty well for a slave in Potiphar's house. But the Bible says that Joseph was a good-looking man. Potiphar's wife lusted after him and she tried to seduce him but he said no that he would not dishonor uh, Potiphar who had been very kind and generous with him and so he tried to avoid but he managed to do that most of the time but one day she cornered him she tried to seduce him one more time she had his cloak and he ran out of it running away from it but she kept the cloak and when her husband came back she said, look what your manager did. He tried to rape me. And Potiphar was furious. He believed his wife instead of the slave. And so they threw Joseph in prison. So there he was in the pit. There he was in Potiphar's house. And now he was in prison. Where was God in all of this? Why didn't God do something? Because Joseph had been chosen for a special mission. Well, I can say this to you. God was there in everything. God was there with him in the pit. Uh, God was with him uh, while he was in Potiphar's house. And God was with him in the prison. It says that God blessed him there. And he was so, uh, so skilled as a manager... They basically made him the manager of the jail. He was there because of a false testimony given against him. You know, I worked in the prison for some 15 years. And you know, over the years, there have been some 375 people released from prison because the DNA evidence showed that they had been falsely convicted. Some 25 or so were on death row. They had been convicted of a crime that they did not commit. And that's only the ones that were released because there was some DNA evidence. I believe that there are many others that are there just because they had a public defender 
and the public defenders were overworked and didn't have time to fool with them. I, I, I was aware of one young man who was definitely guilty of a crime, but he got off because he had a good lawyer. Well, Joseph <laughs> didn't have access to a good lawyer, so he, there he was in prison. And while he was there, <clears throat> Pharaoh sent his baker and his butler to prison as well because of something that they had done. And they both had dreams. And Joseph's interpreting came out again. And he said to the baker, I've got some bad news for you. You're going to go back to Pharaoh's house and you're going to be hanged. And then he told the butler, got some good news for you. You're going to go back to Pharaoh's house and you're going to be restored to your old position. But when you are, remember me, would you? Probably promised, of course, I'll remember you, but he did not. And so, in all of this, here's the message for us. That when we face difficulty, when life seems to be shattered, when we're trying to do the right thing and we suffer even as a result of that, know this, that God is with you. One of the great names for Christ in the Bible is the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus promised, he said, remember, I will be with you always even until the end of the world. Whatever you face, He may not always take you out of that situation, but He's always going to be with you. And then finally, there are fulfilled dreams. Well, for two years, the butler seemingly forgot about Joseph and didn't say anything, but then the king had a couple of bad dreams. And he didn't understand them, and so he called his wise men to interpret them for him, but nobody could. And then the butler remembered, oh, there's this guy in prison, and he explained our dreams, and they came true. So the Pharaoh immediately called for Joseph. And he told him in the dream, he said, in the first dream, there were seven cows coming out of the Nile River, and they were fat, fat cows. Gorditos. And then there were seven, oh wait, seven uh, cows that came in that were skinny. And lo and behold, the skinny cows ate the fat cows, but they were still skinny. And then he had in another dream, and in that dream, there were seven grains, and they were plump and ripe and full. And then there were seven withered up grains. And they consumed the full ones, and they were still poor looking. And Joseph said, well, the dreams are really the same. He said, Pharaoh, for seven years, there's going to be plenty in the land. A lot of grain, a lot of wheat. And then there are going to be seven years of famine. And so Pharaoh said, well, what do I do? He said, well, you get some wise men, and during the seven uh, plentiful years, store up all the extra in the barns in the various cities, and then when the famine comes, you'll have plenty for people to eat. Pharaoh said, yeah, that's exactly what I need to do. And he said, you're a really wise person, so I'm going to put you in charge. And so he became the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. He was like the Tsar of Egypt, or like the Amlo of Egypt. Whatever he said could be done. He had all this power. And so for seven years, he stored uh, one-fifth of the grain in the various cities. And then when the famine came, they began to release the grain. And not only was there a famine in Egypt, but there was also a drought in Canaan. There was Jacob, and he believed that Joseph was dead. And so he sent all of his sons except for Benjamin, the other son of Rachel, and they went to Egypt to buy grain, and immediately Joseph recognized them. But they didn't recognize him because he didn't look like uh, the boy that had been stripped down and was so young when he was sent away. He looked entirely different, but he knew who they were, and you know, he had the opportunity to take revenge against his brothers. That would have been probably what most of us would have been thinking. They 
set him up. They sent him as a slave to Egypt. And now he had a chance to get back at them. Now he did take the time to teach them a lesson. But he did not harm them. He forgave them. And you know what he said to his brothers? He said, you intended all of this for evil, but God planned it for good that I might save many people. He said, you know, you were all a part of God's plan from the beginning. And all the things that I suffered, all of my hardship came because this was God's plan. You know, it doesn't even indicate that he took revenge against Potiphar. Or Potiphar's wife that had been a false witness against him, causing him to go to prison, he forgave. It was part of God's plan that he would forgive people, even the ones that are hard to forgive. <clears throat> the other day, my wife was really good about saying that she's sorry. I appreciate that. And I said to the other day, you know, Jesus said to forgive 70 times 7. Uh, but I think we've used up 490. So this is 491. So you don't have many of those left. You know. Uh, actually, <laughs> I, I she's had to forgive me a lot more than I've had to forgive her. But you and I as believers are to forgive one another. And we should remember that even when we face hardships in life, God is in control. And we are all a part of the plan. In Romans 8, 28, it says, For all things work together for good to those that love God, who are called according to His purposes. Not everything is good. And so we may have dreams, and we may have some shattered dreams, but ultimately, it's all going to be fulfilled. Now, that is not to promise that every time in this world, God is going to completely vindicate us. Sometimes we suffer and you know, I, I noticed in the, the Bible that many times the men of God spent time in prison unjustly. Uh, Joseph did, Jeremiah, Ze uh, Zedekiah, John the Baptist, Peter, Paul, John, and even Jesus himself. All of them were falsely in prison. All of them suffered, and yet this was a part of God's plan. But ultimately God vindicated each one. You know, we've, I've quoted one scripture quite a bit recently, and it's an important one. The reason that we try to fulfill God's plan is that one day we will stand before Him in His judgment. And we are aiming for the day that He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. That is the ultimate reward. Would you bow with me? Gracious God, we thank You that You are in control of the world and you are in control of our lives. Lord, help us to submit ourselves totally unto you, knowing and fulfilling your plan. We pray, O oh God, that your kingdom might come not only one day in heaven, but even in this world. We pray for the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. God, let your Spirit call and claim people all around the world today. In Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen. Thank you.